want to also welcome um, our friends in Lebanon, Virginia tonight who are um, going to be joining us. And um, as our weekly ritual goes, we want to especially welcome up there our good friend Lawrence. And uh, we personally want to welcome him because he feels left out that we don't. So Lawrence, good evening, brother. How you doing? Everybody say hello to Lawrence. There you go. That boy is going to get so sick of hearing that. I'm telling you right now. Let's pray. Sweet Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for coming to be with us tonight. And uh, man, we are so glad that we get to hear from you tonight. We're so glad that we get to hear your truth. We're so glad, we're so glad that we get to hear what it's like for you to um, just bring a freshness, a fresh spirit into us, Lord, and it's a fresh perspective. And um, we just pray tonight for willingness for us to be able to to do that with you in your sweet name. Amen. Amen. So we're starting a new series tonight. Um, For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about getting all keyed up. And um, what we're talking about is taking a good look at some of the some of the keys to recovery that really matter and that are going to sustain us, you know, in the next in the next months. And if this is your uh, this is your first night tonight, we just want to welcome you guys. Um, we know it takes a lot of a lot of energy and a lot of courage to be here and to show up here. If you've had um, you know rough relationships with church. You know, we think you're in the right place. Um, you know, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to come here and um, and really, you know, have a belief in God or have a belief in Jesus. You know, we're just we're here to talk to you and tell you about the love that He has brought into our lives, and um, you are going to decide that for yourself. And uh, you know, um, there's a bunch of people praying that have been praying for you before you ever got here. That. Um, your heart will just be open to what God's going to share tonight, and um, I know that if you'll do that, it'll make a, it's going to make a difference. And so, this is your very first night, you know, the stuff we're going to be talking about applies to someone that's been here 20 minutes and someone that's been here, um, we think, 20 years. So, um, let's get into this. The question is, how do you, how do you maintain sober living? How do, you, how do you experience sober living? How do you sustain sober living and how do you retain you know what it's like to experience that miracle that um, Matt was talking about when that starts to begin to occur in your life when you start to see some real life change when you start to see Jesus move on you when you start to see you know that things are, are looking a little different that there actually is a hot commodity here in this room hope available that there actually is peace available how do you how do you hold that? You know, how do you hold on to that? There's some truth about all of us. You know, and the, the first truth is, is this quote I'm going to put up that the only thing that keeps us from the, spirit, from the spirituality that makes us whole is the attitude of intolerance and belligerent denial. You know, and I'd, I'd be pretty confident that every one of us in this room have gone through the period of time, if we're not in it right now, that basically says, you know what, thank you very much for your sense of direction, but I know better. Or some of you that are the bless your heart southerners, you know, you say, thank you very much, that's just incredible, I really appreciate you telling me that while you're basically flipping them off and not doing it, but I mean, you're sitting there doing all that, but you're blowing people off anyway. And that whole thing of of belligerent denial and intolerance, like what that has to do with is I've become intolerant of another point of view. I become intolerant of anything that is not going to sustain my hurt, habit, or hang up. Because see, it is true that I get used to my habit. It is true that I get used to my addiction. It is true that I get used to my pain. It is true that I begin to accommodate all of that by living in such a way that I make sure that what I'm going through is sustainable. And the intolerance is to someone say, can I show you, saying to you, can I show you some other way? Can I show you something new and different? Can you listen to what it was like for me and what it's like now? 
could I show you what it would be like if this happened right here in your life? What would happen? Would you just take 30 seconds and, and listen to what I want to share? And maybe you are politely listening, but you know, like, really, you've clicked people off a long time ago. That's the intolerance. The, the belligerent denial is the whole, it's not me. It might be you, but it's not me. It's like that phrase, I keep coming back to that phrase of, of terminal uniqueness. You know, I'm not like every other codependent. I have unique qualities and characteristics that only make me a quasi-codependent. I'm just, you know, I, can, I, I don't have to be an alcoholic if I don't want to. Now, you wouldn't say it quite that way, but I've heard that phrase about a million times, and that's exactly what someone's saying to me. I have control of this compulsion in my life, of this addiction in my life that is actually totally out of control, and my denial, my belligerence is, is that I believe I'm totally in control. I would go and sit in Al-Anon meetings, and I would listen to other people talk about their powerlessness. And I, I was like, sucks for you. You know, I just... I'm probably never going to get to that place of total depravity where I got to say that out loud. You might, but that's because of your weakness. I won't because I'm stronger than you. I can get my way around this. I can figure out some way around this. I'm just here to observe, maybe get some tips on how you did it so I can figure out how to do it faster. But I'm not going down this powerlessness path. And see, where we look at that in our denial, we sit and we believe that when people talk to us about powerlessness, that somehow that's a failure. Well, let me just tell you, there's a bunch of people in this room that now actually have the reckless audacity to believe that powerlessness, now get this, is a victory. Amen? Amen. Powerlessness is a victory. It's a win. It's a win. Jesus walks around, the disciples sit there, and they get in their typical obsession. Hey, they say, we just thought we'd like to know, how can we get on your good side, Jesus? How can we be like top dog? How can we be center stage? How I know there's 12 of us, but I want to be the hot shot of the 12. How do I do that? Jesus goes, here's how you do it. They all listen. He says, you pick up your cross, and you follow me, and you lose your life and you become powerless. I mean, step one did not think up step one. Amen? Jesus did. Jesus had it before Bill Wilson did. You know, he did. Bill Wilson would cop to that. Powerlessness. Give up your life. Take up a cross. Follow me. If you want your life, here's how it sounds in the Bible. Step one says, if you want your life, you have to lose your life. Amen? If you want your life, you got to lose your life. That's Jesus. Jesus has it right. You know, in my denial, I did not want to accept that. But you know what? I didn't start to experience freedom until I did accept that. And for all of us in this room to really sustain the sobriety that is available or to get it in the first place, you got to come to this understanding of powerlessness or what we're going to talk about tonight, another side of that, you know, of the same thing really is willingness. Willingness. Powerlessness kind of puts us in a spiritual neutral zone. Willingness takes action. We're going to talk about that tonight. You know, like I, if I, if I needed, you know, like 10 years ago, I would not probably have survived the Christmas season of these last couple of weeks in terms of my own powerlessness. Like here's what happened to me. In the last three years, my ability to control even something as simple as the freaking color of the Christmas lights on the tree is shot. Shot. Yeah. Now, if you look at my tree, red, color, green, orange, all these stupid colors, it should be white. It's not white. What's my, what's my power over that? Zero. Zip. Nada. <laughs> then if that isn't enough, try living with five chicks simultaneously. I defy any guy to tell me what kind of power you got then. If you think you got power, you're an idiot. And also, deranged, you need some help, more than we can give you in this room in the next 15 minutes. And I mean, I don't 
don't have any power over any of that. You know, the older your kids get, the less power you have over them. They do ridiculous things, say ridiculous things, think ridiculous things, hang out with ridiculous people. And what's your, what's your power over that? You can mumble around, well, I really don't think you should be doing that, you know. And it's like, there's nothing there. You've got to go with Jesus on that. Amen? Amen? Belligerent denial sucks life out of the room. Belligerent denial sucks life out of the conversation. Belligerent denial walls you off to the truth that Jesus is trying to get into you. That's what it means about the importance of being open-minded. The, the scripture in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians says, um, I think it's chapter 10, says, submit and take every thought captive. What thoughts am I talking about? I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I can live my life any way I want to. I can do whatever I want. I have total control over him, that, it, her, and everything in between. Willingness is about my availability to the miracle of Jesus that is in this room tonight. Willingness is my ability, my, my desire to imagine God actually going to work on me personally. You know, the gospel, the gospel is not, is not John 3, 16 as it reads that, you know, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for us that we might have life forever. It's got to come right down to me, my name. It's got to come right down to me. Do I believe that God sent Jesus to die for me because I was worth it? Because God saw me as being priceless. Because God saw me as being redeemable. Because God saw an opportunity for a victory in my life. Because God would never look at me and say, she's totally hopeless. He's beyond repair. The idea that he could get better is unimaginable and impossible. And I don't know what to do with him. He's a wreck. I would say that. You would say that. God will never say that. It isn't about God's ability, it's about our willingness. It isn't about God's victory, that's already done tonight. There's no up for grabs wondering around, I wonder if God has a victory over my life. I wonder if Jesus can set me free from the stuff in my life that's binding me. I wonder if it could really be for me. Stop wondering any of that, it's absolute. The victory of Jesus is already claimed and named in this room tonight. Jesus already has a victory over all your stuff tonight. Done, finished, accomplished, over. It's not about him, it's about you. It's not about him, it's about me. Will I, it's not will he, it is will I let him do what he came here to do in my life. Here's a quote. It's easy to let up, this is out of the big book, it's easy to let up it says on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. You know, Kevin comes up, picks up a three-year chip. He says, he declares himself done of needing to go to meetings. I mean, I got three years, three years. Done of needing to talk to a sponsor. Done of needing to take direction. Done of needing to be accountable. Done of needing to be in the fellowship. Done of needing to read the literature. Done of needing to get involved in service. He's done. I mean, this boy's got three years. He's done, man. Because he is resting on that three years. As if somehow that three years means anything tomorrow. What it means is you ought to have three years of knowing that it's one day, one day, one day. One day, one day, three years of one days. It's easy to let up on our spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do. For addiction, alcohol, compulsion, hurts, habits, and hangups, they're a subtle foe. 
we are not cured of any of these hurts, habits, or hang-ups. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. A daily, a daily reprieve. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of what God wants for us into all of our activities. How can I best serve God? Your will, God, not mine, be done. These are thoughts with, which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. Giving up our willpower is what they're trying to say. Giving up our willpower is the proper use of of the will, giving up my authority, giving up my will is the proper use of the will. Jesus says it another way, look at me. I'm standing right at the door of your life tonight. I'm standing right at the door of your life. I'm beating on your chest tonight. I'm beating right on you tonight. I'm standing right at the door of your heart tonight. And I'm, I'm, I'm pounding on your chest. I'm pounding on your heart. I knock. If you hear me call and you open the door, he says, I'll come right in. And I'll sit down to supper with you. I love this. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table. That's like this room tonight. There are people in this room tonight that if you'll go to a group after this, they're going to testify to being conquerors in Jesus over whatever it is that they drug into this room. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I, having conquered, meaning sin, death, and the devil, took the place of honor at the side of my daddy. That's my gift to the conquerors. And tonight, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want you to imagine sitting there at his table as conquerors. And he's saying to you, take my body, take my blood, take my life, take my strength, take my victory, take it into yourself, take it into your life. Don't watch me, take me in so that you're going to sit at the table as a conqueror. You know, how do you do that? You got to be willing to sit down. You got to be willing not to feed yourself toxic food any longer. Amen. You got to be willing to go, I'm going to go hungry until this Jesus starts to feed me. I'm going to stop feeding myself. I'm going to stop shoveling in the food of assumption. I'm going to stop shoveling in the food of guilt. I'm going to stop shoveling in the food of failure. I'm going to stop shoveling in the food of worthlessness. I'm going to stop shoveling in the food from relationships that are messed up. Like we talked about last week, I'm going to stop shoveling in the fact that my identity is based on the stuff I do, and I'm going to be hungry until Jesus comes and feeds me at this table and makes me a conqueror with his own body and blood. That's what I'm going to do. That's what willingness is like. It can't be Jesus plus, 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 plus. It's got to be only Jesus. We got to be willing to be hungry until he is ready to feed us. And sometimes that period of being hungry is what like a, an emptying is all about. You stop doing all the stuff you were doing to cope and you sit there and you're willing to trust him enough to allow yourself to be hungry for a while so that it is he and you'll know that it's him. It is he that is gonna come into your life and when he knocks, you're gonna open the door to your heart and when he comes in, then he's gonna be the host and he's gonna feed you with himself. Practicing step three, this is out of the 12 and 12, is like the opening of a door. How uncanny is that quote right there? If you don't have a 12 and 12 book, get one. To which all appearances, by all appearances, is a door that's closed and locked. All we need is a key. 
and the decision to swing the door open. You think whoever wrote this read that Revelation scripture? <laughs> there is only one key, and it is called willingness. Once unlocked by willingness, the door opens almost of itself. And looking through it, we will see a pathway beside which is an inscription. It reads, this is the way to a faith that works. You want to be a conqueror? You want to sit at the table of conquerors tonight? Open the door. Open the door the door. In the first two steps, we were engaged in reflection. We saw that we were powerless over alcohol, but we also perceived that faith of some kind, if only in AA itself, is possible to anyone. These these conclusions, the first two steps, didn't require action. They required only acceptance. Like all the remaining steps, Step three calls for affirmative action. Step three calls for action. I became willing to turn over. Jesus isn't going to grab it from you. To turn over my life and my will to the care of God so that I could sit tonight at the table of the conquerors. Scripture says this, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Jesus, act like it. Pursue the things over which Jesus is in charge. I love this. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up. And be alert to what is going on around Jesus. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. What Jesus is saying tonight is, look, do you you want to be a conqueror? Do do you want to sit tonight at the table of conquerors? It won't come. It won't come tonight with your wisdom. It won't come tonight with what you go to buy to feed yourself with. It isn't coming tonight based on your wisdom. It isn't coming tonight based on your strength. It's only coming tonight based on your emptiness. It's only coming tonight based on you laying all your weapons down and being hungry that I can feed you in a way that you you have never been fed before and never will again. The night that Jesus took bread for the first time and had the Lord's Supper for the first time, listen, the disciples, they thought they were full. They had just had dinner. They realized when they were with Jesus and he shared this meal, they were empty. They were hungry. They realized he was going to feed them in this way they had never imagined before. And he, he said to them, I want you to take and eat this bread. When you eat from this bread, you will never be hungry again. Man, when he said that, that was different. They were about to sit at the table of conquerors. And then he took a cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them. And he said, I want you to take and drink. This cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood shed for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins and for life. And when you drink from this cup, you will never be thirsty again. And they were about to receive this cup, this body and this blood of Jesus, so that they could sit at the table of the conquerors. This whole room tonight, in one night, can become one huge, massive table of the conquerors. You know what? In Jesus' sweet name, I'm going to pray for nothing less than that. Amen.